Dance Your Heart on Fire podcast, episode number 32. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, definitely. I mean, the, the gender stereotypes will exist and will continue to exist, hopefully not forever, but we're, we're always working against kind of breaking the expectations of society in general. And um, yeah, so I guess coming back to being a female instructor attempting to teach men uh, how to lead, I have received a pretty, um, I've received pretty much every possible reaction, I guess, that you could expect. Um, but the majority have been positive and I am really thankful for those that have trusted me with their learning journey. Welcome to the Dance Your Heart on Fire podcast, the podcast dedicated to inspiring dancers worldwide whose hearts have been touched by music and dance. The universal language of dance and music is spoken by many of us throughout the world. We want to motivate the dancer in you by sharing stories, insights, and ideas to enhance your journey. Join us now with your host, Charles Ogar. Hello, hello, everyone. This is Charles with the Dance Your Heart on Fire podcast coming at you with another weekly podcast. And today we have a special guest who I have not had the pleasure to dance with. It's like been several years now and I still haven't danced with this lovely woman, but we vibe musically and on a lot of things and for our love and passion for Kizomba. But um, she recently had me on her show last week. Um, she has a Kizoma radio show, and I let her tell you a little bit more about that. And we decided to do a trade, so she's coming on to the podcast. And we have none other than Miss Elise with 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 Rock Kizomba. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. How you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for having me. Definitely, definitely. So. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm coming into my, my radio voice a little bit. I want to like, do like a little <laughs> DJ mixing, scratching thing. I don't know. You got to get in the song. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and have you introduce yourself and let our audience know a little bit, a snapshot, if you will, of what you do today. Sure. Uh, so like you said, my name is Elise. I am from Rochester, New York, Western New York. Uh, born and raised closer to New York City and moved to Western New York for school and never left. Um, I started my company here called Rock Kizomba. Um, we have been around for about four years now. Um, my partner, Melissa, uh, and I founded the company together out of kind of necessity for a Kizomba community where there was none previously. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so now we teach weekly classes, we run a studio here, uh, like you mentioned, I have a radio show dedicated to Kizomba once a week. Uh, we do social events and we kind of travel internationally to, to teach and perform as well. Awesomeness, awesomeness, awesomeness. We have to link up our travels and, and dance because I'm pretty sure they're going to be pretty awesome. But I am ready. Yes, I'm ready too. So... I think that the theme for today's podcast is going to be kind of your journey thus far being a female instructor. I know mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about that in the show from last year, and I'll be sure to put a link for that show if you're interested in hearing it. Um, the, the show from last week that I did with Elise, I'll put that in the show notes so you guys can hear it. And I'll also be sure to put in the link so you guys can check in. When is it the show? So the, if the listeners want to check it out, Elise... Yeah, so Rock With Me is my weekly radio show. It is every Thursday at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and you can stream live, wayoradio.org, W-A-Y-O. 
Awesome. And if you're lazy, the link is going to be in the podcast show notes. Yeah. Deal. All right. So let's go take a walk down memory lane, Elise. And sure. how were you first introduced into Kizomba? So it was kind of by accident. Uh, I had a dance partner about five years ago who was from the West Coast, from Seattle. And uh, he was working on learning English and becoming a little bit stronger in terms of being an instructor in salsa. And we kind of traded my translating skills for um, some dance training. And he and I worked together for about a year. Um, And he kind of showed me Kizomba offhand one day, the little bit that he knew. um, And I was you know, a couple months into my salsa training and realized that salsa was cool, but Kizomba was definitely more my speed. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it was a a brief introduction there, but I was definitely hooked from the, from the get-go. Awesomeness, awesomeness. And how long did it take for you to become addicted? hmm, That's a good question. So I guess I was immediately intrigued, but Mm -hmm. maybe not quite addicted because I hadn't really fully experienced uh, the awesomeness that is Kizomba at Mm -hmm. that point. Um, I had a taste and I definitely wanted more. I went to Toronto for the first time way back when Layla from Kiz Me was organizing events up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, she brought Tony Parada for a weekend and they had a big party. And so I attended as a guest and took kind of my first workshop with Tony and And that was definitely the beginning of the addiction. I got to feel what a real party felt like and a social. And and I was around amazing dancers and uh, danced with Tony Parada and was just kind of blown away. And I think that's where the uh, where the addiction really took hold at that point. So it was a Kizoma only party at that particular time. Yeah. Yeah, they played some Zook, some Compa, but but Kizomba was definitely the focus that night. Definitely. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So you came across, you said you had a taste, you wanted more. You went to this awesome event with uh, Tony Pirata and you had an awesome experience. So the addiction sets in and then you go home and what Mm. happens? Yeah, and then the depression sets (laughs) in. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that post festival depression syndrome. Yeah. So I uh, got home and, you know, realized that it wasn't going to happen on its own. And uh, at the time here in Rochester, nobody even really knew what Kizomba was. So they kind of thought maybe it had something to do with Zumba or I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was basically um, start something myself or kind of let it die. And I, I just couldn't do that. I was, I had the taste of it and I wanted more and I wanted to see it progress here um so it was kind of out of necessity nobody else was going to kind of pick up the ball and run with it so that was me that was my turn all right so right now there is a gap between how you met melissa or maybe she i know she's an important part of it as well and this post festival depression after you had the thing (laughs) with uh, tony parata so go ahead and let us know how melissa came into the picture So Melissa danced tango for years, I think seven or eight years previously, and is just an incredible follower. And and, uh, she came to one of the first, I'll put classes in quotation marks, but one of the first times I dabbled with introducing Kizomba to other people. Um, And she and I danced a couple times during that class and just clicked. It was, you know, I led her in the couple of things that I knew how to lead. And we both just were kind of shocked at how easily we connected with each other. I didn't know what I was doing. She was brand new to it. She was a great follower and just kind of being supportive and going along with it. But we kept in touch. And uh, I approached her when I was getting ready to take the plunge into figuring out how to start a a community here and asked her if she'd be interested. And and she, for whatever reason, (laughs) felt like she could trust my vision and kind of went with it. And here we are. I haven't also danced with Melissa. So, Melissa, if you're listening, I'm coming for you as well. (laughs) So uh, I'm curious because with my own journey, it was also out of necessity um, I didn't really look for an opportunity to teach. Um, I didn't teach anything before, but a studio approached me and gave me the opportunity. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, did you teach any kind of dance or anything else outside of dance before you started teaching Kizomba? 
Yeah. So my mom has been a jazzercise instructor for 20 some odd years. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I grew up in a dance teacher household um, and kind of followed in her footsteps and, you know, dabbled in jazzercise and then ended up in Zumba. Mm -hmm. Um, And I taught Zumba for years um, just for the fact that I was obsessed with music and movement and I made a good instructor and people kind of flocked to my classes. And um, so, yeah, Zumba was both a a great asset to me, but also uh, made Kizomba a very difficult transition. Um, Uh It taught me how to cue and how to command a room and Uh how to effectively communicate and move other people through um, movement. Um, But it also made me a really terrible follower. Yeah, (laughs) I can imagine. The uh, the independence and the kind of self direction taught in Zumba is pretty much the direct contrast to some of the qualities you need to possess as a follower in Kizomba. Mm-hmm. So that definitely made for an upward hill that I had to to tackle, but it definitely helped me in my my teaching aspect, I guess. For sure. All right, and the name Rock Kizomba is that a play on the word of Rochester for where you're from? Yes. Yeah. So it was, I remember sitting on my bed and trying to put a Facebook group or page together and just saying, at least, all right, just pick something. You know, mm-hmm. you could come up with a million different creative names. You need something so that you can create a page and start this, start this journey. And so I live in Rochester and we're teaching Kizomba and I wanted something succinct, but kind of, I don't know, that left an impression. And so someone suggested Kizomba Rock and that just didn't sound right to me. So mm-hmm. rock, rock Kizomba it was and we, we ran with it. <laughs> awesomeness, awesomeness, awesomeness. So listening to your story here, uh, I see a gap. Okay. So in the times that you were dabbling to show or introduce Kizomba, you were leading. But in the festival where you were first introduced to Kizomba, I'm assuming you were following. So yes. when did you make the decision to start leading in Kizomba? And how did that process go in its early stages? Yeah, so very quickly I realized that there was no potential for growth unless I learned how to lead in order to grow a community here. You know, mm-hmm. we had to create leaders in order for people to be able to dance. And if I didn't know that half of the dance, there was there was no opportunity there. Um, so I started a lot of work independently to figure out how to move myself first. Um, took lots of workshops, both as a leader and a follower and every opportunity that I got. And then Melissa was a huge asset to me because she's an incredible follower and was able to help me reverse engineer and understand Mm -hmm. what works and what doesn't. Uh, The feedback that she has provided in my journey as a lead, you know, since the inception is invaluable. Um, So I attribute a lot of my success definitely to her expertise. Followers, having an experienced follower by your side as a leader is super, super, super important. It sure is. I know we've had a couple of conversations off the books about this, just like leaders self-assessing their skill versus having a follow there along their side. But if you take a look at the best Kizoma dancers and the leads that we have in the scene, there is or was, has been um, an experienced follow by his side to kind of help him get to that point. Most definitely. I, I think it is something that you know, people don't necessarily pay enough attention to or give enough credit towards. Um, but it's, like you said, it's invaluable. I don't, I don't know how you become an elite leader, as we've mentioned before, without that elite follower and that feedback that they can give you. For sure. And that's kind of the reasons, or at least one of the undertones of the podcast is kind of shedding some light on the values that followers add to the dance scene. And this is definitely one of those things. So I've come across many females who were in your shoes who had to learn how to lead and learn how to follow simultaneously. And I know Mm -hmm. it isn't very easy to switch gears at the beginning. Um, One person that comes to mind is Monique out of Oklahoma. Um, There was a time in Oklahoma where she was the best lead and the best follow in the city, you know, because she had to kind of learn both. And now, after a year or so of kind of doing both, she's able to switch gears, and now she's like a real asset 
to the socials because she's like a like an, in the game of chess. She's a queen. She does kind of does everything. She can yeah. lead and she can follow, so she can kind of fill in where she can, where a lot of leaders don't can't are not able to do that. You know. Um, so I wonder if you have any tips um, or advice for any other followers who may find themselves in that particular role and I guess share any any insights you may have. Sure, I really like that analogy, a queen in the game of chess. That's mm-hmm. a pretty cool, pretty cool way of saying it. Um, and it is it is a pretty. Um, I enjoy being able to attend a social, especially now as a leader and a follower. Um, I don't have to sit out much, you know. I get Definitely. kind of, I get my pick of, you know, who I want to dance with, and you know, let the music decide whether I want to lead or I want to follow. Or um, so, in terms of advice for other women out there, I think one of the biggest pieces of advice that I can uh, that I can give is to be bold and don't be afraid to to experiment um, in your biggest moments of insecurity is when you're going to find the most growth when you put yourself outside of your comfort zone and you try something that you don't think that you might you might not think that you might be good at it but in reality if you put enough time into it and you practice you probably will do a pretty good job um, a lot of women that I dance with will kind of look at me in shock afterwards and say I didn't know a woman could lead like that mm-hmm. you know and it's you don't know unless you try and uh, you might not like it and that's fine it's not for everybody but but unless you experiment and put yourself in that position, you'll you'll really never know if you can sink or swim. Definitely. That's awesome to hear because uh, I know it's not easy switching the gears and kind of dedicating time to do both and things like that. But I feel like in the long run, it definitely pays off in, in dividends to become one of those queens. Certainly. And I think surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals is really important as well. Um, I've grown a ton in the past year or so because of the people I think that I've um, surrounded myself with and finding other women that share that kind of a vision and that support you um, or men, you know, in that, in that role is key. Uh, If you're on an Island by yourself and you're, or you're trying to do something different, it it can be not always well received. Um, So identifying a mentor and somebody that you can kind of look up to and ask questions of and get encouragement and direction from is very important as well. I think that, that seeking of a mentor is important on so many levels across life, not just in dance, but like fitness wise or accounting or trying to make more money or just things like that. I think it's really important to have people and have that support system. And that's not really something that you think about, but until you've kind of hit your head on the wall a couple of times, it's like, why isn't this working? Yes. But, um, but somebody else has gone through it before you. Chances yeah, are definitely. So having a support system in place to help, you through those times and, and if you take a look at really really successful people they didn't get there by themselves they they put themselves around an environment that was able to get them to grow to that level you know exactly so that's really awesome you learned how to lead and you, you took charge and you were bold like you were saying before to kind of put yourself out there i wonder at the beginning of your journey of starting to teach if you had any fears of wanting to teach other men how to lead and if you ran into any resistance with those i'm pretty sure you might have some some stories you want to share with us (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) um definitely i mean the the gender stereotypes will exist and will continue to exist hopefully not forever but we're, we're always working against kind of breaking the expectations of society in general and Mm -hmm. um yeah so i guess Coming back to being a female instructor attempting to teach men uh, how to lead, I have received a pretty, um, I've received pretty much every possible reaction, I guess, that you could expect. Um, But the majority have been positive. And I am really thankful for those that have trusted me with their learning journey. Um, You know, I don't, I'm not the best of anything. You know, I'm giving everything that I have and I give my personal best. Um, But, you know, I guess it's the typical situations that you would expect. You know, a woman can't do it as well as a man, and mm-hmm. a woman can't move the same way that a man can, and a woman doesn't have the same posture or the same frame or the same physique as a man. How could I possibly learn anything from you? Um, that's definitely been the minority in terms of the response that I got. Uh, it took a while to get the respect, I think, and for people to acknowledge that, yes, I can lead and yes, I can successfully teach both men and women uh, in this partner dance. Um, and I think, 
you know, I definitely had to work a little bit harder than, than a gentleman might. Um, coming into a class as two women is always, it's always an interesting reaction. You know, I'll stand on the side with the leaders and Melissa will stand with the followers and everyone kind of gives me a, a quizzical look in terms of, well, who am I supposed to be following and what are you doing? Um, so I try and refer to people as leaders and followers, not men and women or ladies and gentlemen, you know, and try and take the gender part out of it from the get-go and just identify as the person leading the dance and the person following the dance and allowing those to be fluid roles um, it helps a lot. And uh, yeah, I'm rambling a little bit, but that no, was kind of a, a long-winded answer to, I think, what you asked me. For sure. Um, I've been dabbling and following as well. Um, uh, it definitely helps when you're teaching to kind of speak from the perspective of both roles. And there's a couple of times in my privates, I'm like, OK, well, I want you to just walk forward and I'm going to give you the intention of what I'd like to feel. And then mm -hmm. I'm like, OK, you feel that right there and now flip it. Now I want you to flip the role. And that definitely helps um, when I'm teaching follows. And for leads, there's sometimes where it's like I can explain till for years and years and years the way something is supposed to feel but if, until they actually feel it then they get it you know so there have been a couple of times or many times in my privates where i'll take them and, and show them basic one or the force needed to move around and the balance and things like that and they get it and that mm -hmm. speaks so much more clearly to them versus me just telling them you know absolutely and, as a, as a male instructor, and I talked a little bit about this in the, in the show, I can teach all the moves. I can teach the Saidas and the shuffle steps and syncopations and all these things, and I can watch them and they can look okay. But mm -hmm. the real stamp of approval is them to make sure that they feel good dancing with, you know, and I, I can give that perspective on a really high level. And that's why it's really important to have a follow there to kind of give that feedback. And it's interesting sometimes because even in, in some of the dance partnerships, um, some of the famous partnerships that I've seen in, in classes, like the follow doesn't have a very active role in, in the learning. But I still feel like they have so much value that they're not they're not tapping into. So it's, it's interesting, you know. Absolutely. It's funny because uh, in, in our dance company in general, we're working through kind of how to structure our classes and provide more effective workshops and in, especially in a larger group setting, how to cater to both the leaders and the followers simultaneously. Uh, and oftentimes I will, I'll do a lot of the talking and Melissa will do a lot of the rotating throughout the class, uh, as well as James, who's another member of our group. And uh, the value of having a, a vocal person in the center, but also kind of one of your soldiers in the mm -hmm. ranks is a huge, huge asset to the class. Uh, and having a follower be able to rotate through the class and provide one-on-one -on -one feedback to each leader that she dances with um, is incredibly important. And I think people lose sight of that very easily because there is a mouthpiece, you know, there is the person moving the group, mm -hmm. um, but those other those other members of the team that are providing that, that feedback on an individual level are, are invaluable, yeah. again. <laughs> I've been through a couple of workshops where sometimes the leader and the follower of a dance partnership don't even cycle through the class. And mm -hmm. I know sometimes, depending on the size and things like that, it's it's not feasible, but I feel like there should be an attempt for sure because mm, especially if you're doing weekly classes, I can see if you're having a workshop and you have 100 people in your classes, but private lessons, um, more intimate classes, I've been doing uh, this kind of more intimate learning thing called training shows or focus groups where you limit the number of people so I'm able to give more quality feedback to each person and I don't have to like spread my attention out and that is a high value high quality environment for learning you know and if you really really love the teaching aspect that just kind of speaks to your soul because you're able to touch more people than you are just kind of just quality or quantity wise I'm sorry Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and it's it's uh, providing something that is specific and um, valuable to mm -hmm. people rather than just kind of, you know, moving them through an hour of footwork and you know, sending them on their merry way. That sure. Some people are, are interested in that, but I like to give a lot more. Definitely. That's awesome. Let's take a quick moment to thank our sponsors. Have you been looking to level up your Kizomba, but you don't have the local instructors to take you there? Are you looking for something concrete to practice with your Kizomba partner? Or are you looking for Kizomba lessons that you can take on your schedule and the comfort of your home? 
If you answered yes to any of these questions, look no further. LearnToKids.com is what you need. Progressive, step-by-step -step lessons that you can take at your pace in the comfort of your home or anywhere with a solid internet connection on your PC, Mac, or any smartphone. New videos are added every month. You can try this awesome resource out 30 days free at LearnToKids.com slash podcast. After the 30 days free, it's only a low $15 per month. But again, the special offer for the Dance Your Heart On Fire listeners, 30 days free at LearnToKids.com slash podcast. You won't find this offer anywhere else. LearnToKids.com slash podcast. And now back to our show. So before we get into your journey on trying to uh, get booked and mm. teach at, at festivals and, and workshops and things like that outside of Rochester, I wanted to kind of shine a little bit of light on the emotional side of mm. leading and following. I wonder, I've talked to some other female instructors and they say when they lead, they kind of tap into a little bit of a, of a masculine energy, you know, and when they follow, they, they tap into more of a, a feminine energy, you know, and uh, it's possible for that energy to be, I guess, possessed by a male or a female. So it's not a gender thing, but there's definitely a vibe that you need when you're leading versus when you're following, you know. Sure. So I wonder if you have any any insights or realizations that you come across over the years to share. It, it's funny because we've been on a couple road trips recently and been having a lot of long talks in the car because we've had ample time to chat. Mm -hmm. um, but I was actually just talking to my team about um, about my lead and, and what it feels like and what is it that stands out or what is it that, uh, especially to Melissa, you know, what is it that you feel that you connect with? And um, she mentioned a maternal energy mm. and it's kind of a protective um I don't know if you think about an embrace, you think about a hug and the feeling that, you know, a mother, a motherly touch that, mm -hmm. that, that you would feel and the security that comes from that, um, as opposed to a masculine feel. Um, so I think it's different. I will find that followers, not all, but some respond more to my lead and, and, and relax more, mm -hmm. um, because I am a woman and they can trust even a little bit more. Um, there, there isn't a sexual or, or threat of any of that kind of energy yeah. coming from my vibe, I guess in general. Um, and so that allows them to connect a little bit differently. I do tend to kind of, I think of it as two different roles that I would play in a, in a show, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, as a follower, I, I play one character and as a leader, I play a different character. And so um, different pieces of my personality will come out depending on which role I'm playing. Um, but I try to remain kind of true to who I am as a dancer, regardless of whether I'm leaning or following. I For don't, sure. it's not just passive and dominant. There's, there's a, there's a, there's a blend in there yeah. between those different energies. But I, I liked the way she described that, that kind of maternal energy, that encompassing, um, you know, safety, I guess, mm -hmm. is, is something that was and really I striking was, to me. I almost like on, I feel like saying that, it's also possible for a paternal kind of energy to also be safe. You sure, know? absolutely. So the common denominator would be safety and kind of like accepting, you know? I don't know. Yes. It's interesting. Yes. Yeah, I'd never heard it posed that way before, so it, it kind of struck a chord with me when you were asking about that, that kind of energy. No, I feel like, so there's been this quote that's been on my mind over and over again. I don't, I, I think I just heard somebody like I overheard somebody say like the dance is what happens in between the steps, you know? And I feel like that's why I feel so inspired mm -hmm. to like do the videos and the kid connection and, and the podcast and things like that because outside of the steps, there's this big, huge world of emotional happiness and, and healing and coping sometimes, you know? And be, it doesn't matter the steps that you're doing, you know, but like that emotional part of it is just really, really important. And it's hard to give that a voice at a social and it's hard to give that a voice for an ample amount of time in a workshop. So I, I love this format of the podcast and the YouTube videos that I'm going to be starting and things like that to kind of shine light on that very important aspect of it, you know. Me too. One of my favorite workshops to teach is our Kizomba connection workshop. And there's no footwork. There's no pattern taught. It's it's strictly connection. And it can still be challenging in a group setting. The smaller the class, usually the better that mm -hmm. is received. Um, but I've had 
really great feedback on, on that subject matter. And not a lot of people go there, you know, not a lot of people maybe, I think people are afraid of teaching it, honestly, because it's not an easy concept to mm-hmm. impart on somebody else. It's, it's a feeling, it's a, um, it's not a tangible thing that you For can sure. break down necessarily. Um, but it's fun to, to get people to experiment with for sure. Yeah. I feel once your, your, your mind is, has been enlightened to that power, it's hard to ignore it. You yeah. have to, you have to give it a voice. Yes. It doesn't feel. Cause you want to share it. Yeah. So why, why should I be the only one that gets to experience this? For Other sure. people deserve this too. Definitely. All right, Elise, I'm loving the conversation so far. Um, (laughs) Let's go ahead and keep it rolling. And you mentioned that you traveled to a couple of festivals and then workshops in different places and things like that. Have you met any resistance as far as being like a female lead or that person for when you come to like when it comes to getting booked at festivals and things like that? It can be tough. Uh, I find that the Kizomba community is relatively accepting when it comes to maybe not such traditional setups for um, partnerships. Um, when I've worked with festivals that are more Latin centered, so Bachata festivals or SBK kind of events, that tends to be where I find more of a hurdle in, in getting um, acceptance in mm-hmm. as a female instructor or a female pair. Um, in Kizomba only events, to be honest, I really haven't seen a lot of negative feedback about it. I think one of the bigger um, concerns was performing. Mm. Um, and so, well, if you don't have a partner, then, you know, how are you going to perform? You know, and so I, I do have a partner and we have performed together and we have a performance team as well that we work on. Mm-hmm. Um, but that seems to be the biggest complaint, I guess, is uh, is on the performance side from just from, from recent experience. For sure, because it's still relatively a new thing, you know. Definitely. It makes sense. Yes. I'm also curious what percentage of males and females can uh, comprise of your private lessons. For me, like I get a heavy majority of females for mm-hmm. my private lessons. So I'm wondering as for you, I'm kind of curious because you're a female, but then you also lead. Do you find it even balanced? Is do you just find that more women kind of invest in their learning more so or what has been your experience i've had a really solid balance between men and women actually and uh I would say in the beginning, it was like when we first started Kizom in Rochester, mm-hmm. it was almost exclusively men because they were mystified by the leading process in general. And mm-hmm. they wanted to learn fast and they wanted to get good enough to get by. Mm-hmm. Um, then we kind of had a transition into the followers, realizing that it's not salsa or bachata and that mm-hmm. the lead is very different and there's an art to the connection. And so I kind of saw a wave of females kind of come through. Um, but kind of now as we're more established and we've been around for a little bit longer, It's a pretty solid mix. I get a lot of men coming to me looking for um, someone that can teach them how to lead, but also give them feedback on their lead as a follower. Mm -hmm. I also have a lot of women come to me that want to be led by me. They Mm -hmm. don't necessarily come for lady styling or, you know, technique of that sort. They're they're looking for, you're a follower, but you know how to lead. How do I do a better job? Um, So recently it's, I'm, I'm excited. It's a really good, good division between men and women seeking private lessons here and a lot of a lot of couples too which is encouraging yes 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 definitely i've had a couple of private lessons where i had to become dr phil i'm not sure if you have because of the dynamic (laughs) that is always fun i I prefer them in a group class and then i make them stand on opposite ends of the room and then come back together at the end it's crazy so um i know with your kizoma journey thus far you also became a mother So I'm also very curious to hear if there's any any insights on your passion and your drive for Kizomba and the way that you saw it before becoming a mother and how that has changed. Because you you, you mentioned before there was a maternal kind of energy to your lead. Mm. So I wonder if that's always been the case or was that heightened after you Mm. actually became a mother? I'm Mm. curious. I have to ask Melissa on that one, but no, uh, I think, well, first of all, don't, uh, dancing when you're pregnant is one heck of an experience. <laughs> <laughs> Your tarshing is non-existent after a couple of months, but, uh, but after the fact, um, it has made me reprioritize a lot and kind of re focus and kind of set my priorities anew. Um, before we were kind of doing this and involved 
involved in everything and doing social events and teaching and traveling and private lessons and performing and, you know, trying to do all of it. Um, and the fact of the matter is there has to be balance, especially mm-hmm. when family is, you know, part of the picture. And so personally, I've kind of taken a step back from organizing social events. And I think that my time for the community is best spent teaching. Um, so, you know, our weekly classes and events for our studio have become my primary focus. Um, I've been delegating a lot more and my team is amazing at kind of t- taking the torch and running with it as well and, mm-hmm. and diversifying our offerings. So I'm really fortunate that I have James and Melissa as uh, assets to our company. They're, they're, they're my partners. Um, and so I think it's, it's forced me to kind of self-assess what are you good at? What is your, what is your biggest strength and mm-hmm. what is the best thing that you can contribute? Um, so my radio show uh, accidentally <laughs> became Yeah, let's talk a little of, about that. Sure. Um, So I kind of fell into that opportunity. My studio is in the same building as Wayo Radio. It's a low frequency uh, volunteer based radio station and they have over 200 shows per week that are uh, actively participating all by volunteers. Kind of knocked on the door one day and, you know, introduced myself and just kind of poked my nose in and wanted to see what was going on. And they were super receptive to, you know, me and our company and what we're doing. And so I, they offered me a, a slot and I was terrified. Yeah. <laughs> my hands shook through the, the whole first show um, completely outside of my comfort zone but that's kind of been the theme of this past year you know major life changes becoming a mom and, mm-hmm. and all, you know the, the challenges that come along with that and you know why not try something new and uh, I'm really loving it it's going far better than I could have imagined it's creating avenues for um, people to connect and giving voice to some people that might not have had an opportunity to speak helping connect other communities that are maybe kind of starting out where we started um, and just like a very similar to what you're doing, just mm-hmm. creating new forms in which people can can talk about what they're passionate about and, and share the knowledge and some music. You know, I, I'm a bit of a music freak, so mm-hmm. getting to put some of my some of my favorite stuff out there and support other artists is is really fun. So that was a tangent. I don't know where I started, but but yeah. <laughs> no, we're talking about um, being a mother and then reprioritizing and yes. self assessing, and then that tied into the radio show, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, I also want to let our audience know that you do have an actual home base studio that you yes. opened up with um, when you first started. Um, I don't think we talked about that at the beginning, but I think that's an important part of your journey thus far as well. Um, can you share a little bit about that before we sure. say that goodbye? Was- huge leap um, opening our own space we had rented space and kind of bounced around and taught in clubs and taught in bars and all over the place but never really had a home base and so I found kind of an industrial building that was carved up into artist space and glass blowers and all kinds of different um, artistic venues as well as a radio station Mm -hmm. Um, but I found this space and and you know decided to take the plunge and sign a lease and sign up for monthly rent. And yeah. Um, yeah, so I we furnished it. And, you know, the first thing I put in there was a couch. And, like, I need this to be a comfortable and safe environment for people. And I want people to have somewhere they can come and, and hang out and um, feel like they belong somewhere. For sure. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, let's see, it'll be two years in January that we've been in that space. Um, and I love it. It's, and I'm it's, curious, how old is your daughter? She will be a year in January on the 25th. So you're like hitting kind of a milestone annually, so to speak. Yeah. First was the studio, then becoming a mom, and then who knows what's around the corner. Right. (laughs) Awesomeness, awesomeness, Elise. So Elise, it's been awesome to have you here on the show. And I'm glad that we finally had a chance to kind of get you on the show here with the podcast and allow you to kind of share your journey and your insight because we're both kind of like, I guess, soldiers kind of helping push Kizomba here in the States. So it's kind of cool to join forces and do that together. First, we did your show and now we have my show and we can definitely do multiple shows on either platform. It doesn't matter here. Um, but like you said before, creating those forums to how people to allow people to, I guess, give that voice to the awesome connection of what it is that they're feeling with this beautiful dance of Kizomba is, is very, very important. And with it being so small in the United States, I feel these forums are really, really important to get more people in the door and touch more people, reach out to more people. But then once they're in the door and they're 
find Kizomba to keep them there, you know, because obviously you go through ups and downs as with anything in life. You know, I think it's important to kind of give that support system, like we said before, um, for these people so they can continue to embrace the dance and learn the dance and and kind of grow in skill and also in self-awareness as for themselves. Absolutely. Anything we can do to make somebody else's journey easier and more positive for me is is super important. So mm-hmm. I really appreciate everything that you do and the the journey that you have endured up until this point and the positive energy that you're putting out into the community definitely does not go unnoticed. And uh, I'm happy to contribute in whatever way that I can. Definitely. So at this time, I'd like to kind of give you an open mic session and just kind of speak to our audience of Kizumbero and, and fellow dancers and let you give any advice or tips or inspiration okay so i think one of my biggest pieces of advice would be to focus on the positive and let the negative roll off i was listening to a podcast from archie this morning from their kizomba brotherhood and uh that was one of the big things that they were mentioning was uh the negative voices seem to get the most attention because often they're the loudest Mm -hmm. um but putting positive energy out there uh, you will get it back and uh to just surround yourself like we said with other like-minded individuals that are going towards the same goal that you are and are passionate about the same things um trust yourself and trust your gut Mm -hmm. self-awareness is important but self-doubt can can really work against you so believe in your abilities and uh and yeah you can you can definitely um you can do both you can lead you can follow you don't have to sacrifice one for the other it's just finding the right balance and um and keeping your priorities straight that's awesome beautiful words beautiful words by the lovely elise um, if our audience wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do so? Yeah, they can find us on Facebook, ROC Kizomba, or our website, rockizomba.com. Um, I'll be posting a radio show page soon, but there is a mixed cloud as well. We could post the link for that in, in the description here, too. For sure. Awesome. All right, Elise, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'm sure I'll be catching you or meeting you soon to dance. It better be soon. Yes, absolutely. If nothing else, it will be at your festival in July. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for checking out the Dance Your Heart on Fire podcast today. Be sure to check out neokizomba.com for links to everything that we chatted about today, as well as some awesome free resources to enhance your Kizomba journey. Disfarçar amor, tá de acendido Muito sem o medo